Welcome everyone to Tissue Aesthetics on Anterior Implants. I'm Dr. Liam Brady. Um, I am a general dentist. I practice in Glendale, Arizona. I also teach uh, both nationally and internationally. And we're going to spend our time together talking about, from a restorative dentist perspective, what do we do to maximize the predictability and the aesthetic outcome when we're doing anterior implant reconstructions or restorative dentistry. And so we want to start today just with a few logistics. First, for those of you who would like a copy of this presentation um, to print the PDF or to keep it on your desktop of your computer, I'm happy to provide that for you. If you want to just get, literally go to my website, the web address is listed here. Under resources, you're going to see handout requests and you can just literally do the request. It'll send me an email and I'll email you back with a PDF of the entire presentation. I also want to take just a moment to thank um, both Dental XP, who's hosting this continuing education. You know, I can't say enough good things about what they're doing and how their platform has really helped um, bring fantastic quality CE to pretty much everybody in the world. But also a special thanks to DECA Lasers uh, for sponsoring this program. I work with DECA, I do some education for them, as well as having one of their CO2 lasers, a Vero laser, in my office. Um, and I really want to thank them both for their commitment to education, what they do to help dentists be the best they can be, but also their commitment to patients, which shows up not only in their education, but in the philosophy behind the equipment that they sell. So thank you both DECA and Dental XP for putting this together for us today. So as we get started, I just want to lay out um, kind of an idea construct of how we're going to spend our time together. We're going to spend probably about half of the time on treatment planning because, you know, being able to get predictable results, knowing ahead of time what's possible, what's not possible, all comes down to treatment planning. And then being able to make some decisions about do we need to change things like tooth position or gingival or osseous contouring before we do fixture placement so that we can optimize the results we're going to get. Then we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about, from the point of view of the restorative dentist, what can I do to optimize the gingival aesthetics, the tissue aesthetics around an anterior implant? From tissue contouring, as in a case like this where the patient presents for a single central with nothing but a healing abutment. So what do I need to do from a surgical perspective or a tissue alteration perspective to optimize things? How do I use provisionalization to help me create the maximum that I can get out of my gingival crest in my papilla position? And then lastly, abutment design. So how would I ask the laboratory to send me back is going to impact the final tissue scallop, tissue placement. So that'll just give you a frame of how we're going to spend our time together. And so we're going to start with treatment planning. And you know, treatment planning for me really is the crux of predictability. It's also where the patient and I get our expectations aligned. You know, really the biggest reason that we have issues with dentistry at the end of a case is because the patient had an expectation in their head. They had a picture in their head or they believe we said something they were going to get as an end result that then didn't come to fruition. So spending time really helping our patients get clear expectations, clear pictures of what we can do predictably and where we can try things, but it's actually unpredictable, it's a little risky, we're pushing the envelope and then letting them choose which of those they would like really will help these cases be successful. Now I have to tell you, I mean, I, I love the idea of putting a fixture in every single spot where there's a tooth that's missing or a tooth that may become missing because we're going to treatment plan its extraction. But that isn't always the way to optimize the aesthetics or to optimize the outcome. And sometimes it is we can place a fixture because we love the idea of individual teeth and flossing and hygiene and the predictability of holding the bone. But we need to do things to optimize that site before we can do implant placement. So that's, the, that's how we're going to talk through things. Um, you have a situation like this one. You're actually going to kind of see a final result of this on the last slide uh, where the patient presents and breaks a tooth off. We want to try to put a fixture in there because the patient chose that he didn't feel like he wanted to undergo the risk of an endodontic procedure, a post and core, minimal feral, and then dealing with a restoration that probably would ultimately fail. And we'd have to have the conversation about having that implant done again, but we'd just do it five years or 10 years in the future. And then thinking about how do I set up the occlusion so this is successful? How do I set up the surgical outcome so that it's successful? And it ended up this treatment plan went from a single implant to being um, about five or six months of Invisalign and equilibration, appliance therapy, um, then doing the actual fixture placement and then the restorative dentistry. So planning is going to be a critical piece of us getting our outcomes that we desire and meeting our patients' expectations. 
So when we think about implant placement, I'm going to go through um, some very specific points. I'll tell you that um, I've learned a lot of this information over the years from lots of different folks. Um, I really love um, a lot of these points come from John Coyce, and I'll tell you, he's really organized his thoughts about implant treatment planning in a way that works for me. I like uh, numbered lists, and I like to be able to go check things off and say, I thought about this, and I looked at that. And so the first place that we're going to start is with the concept of tooth position. So in a situation where we're going to place an implant and there actually is still a tooth or the root of a tooth in place, what are the things that we're going to look at about that tooth position and its relative position to adjacent teeth that are going to help us predict whether or not we're going to have success as far as final gingival contour or not? Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because the most common um, side effect or complication or um, thing that we're unhappy about when we do implant placement is gingival recession. It's the actual tissue placement after everything is said and done, the healing has happened, and all of the restorations are put in place that we look at our cases and our patients look at our cases and go, we wish we had a better result. It would be in the area of where is the tissue? And it's that movement of the tissue, most specifically the recession or the resorption of both the osseous tissues, the hard tissues, and the movement of the soft tissues, that's the thing we struggle the most with, that seems the most unpredictable, and that's, we want to start by looking at how does tooth position impact that. So what are the things that we know? Well, we know that we can pretty much count on at least a millimeter of, of apical migration or gingival recession right at the free gingival margin. So literally just the um, just taking the tooth out, the trauma from the extraction, the loss of the PDL is going to result in at least a millimeter of apical migration. Now when we look at that tooth position, and specifically I would say, I love the photograph where you can look at a tooth down the incisal edge. So you're taking almost an occlusal photograph, but kind of focused in or cropped in on the anterior teeth. Teeth that are facially positioned, and so the incisal edge is facial, the root profile is facial, are going to have a much higher risk of that recession. So they're going to be the ones that get that millimeter and then some versus teeth that are perfectly positioned in the arch, the arc of the anterior teeth, or teeth that are lingually positioned. I love when I look at an upper incisor that we're going to take out and do an implant, and the tooth is actually what we call retroclined or tipped to the lingual, um, because I know that then, am I still going to get some recession? I'm absolutely going to predict some recession, but I'm not going to be in that high risk category. Okay, And so when we think about that recession, we're going to see at least a millimeter migration from a gingival perspective a tissue perspective, what about what's happening at the bone? In that case, I'm really expecting at least a millimeter and a half of, um, of needing bone between those teeth. Why? Because if I don't have at least a millimeter and a half in approximately, so between the root of the tooth we're going to take out and then the root of the tooth that we're going to be leaving in place, the adjacent teeth, I want to look and say, I have a millimeter and a half of interproximal bone crest. When I have teeth that are crowded, they're rotated, they're very tight together, the root proximity is close, and I have this very, very tiny little peak of bone, I'm going to see much more recession or osseous resorption than I will when I have a nice, thick millimeter and a half crest of bone interproximally. So two of the things that I'm going to look for when I evaluate my preoperative tooth position is facial-lingual tooth position. So if the tooth is facial, high risk for gingival recession and osseous resorption. If the tooth is in the right alignment and or lingually, now I'm in a category where I can feel comfortable. I'll still get some movement, but I'm not going to get an unpredictable amount of movement. And then I'm also going to look at root proximity or positioning of that tooth to the two adjacent teeth. And what I want to see ideally is at least a millimeter and a half dimension to the interproximal osseous crest. Less than that puts the tooth at high risk of gingival recession. The next thing we're going to talk about is um, now that we've looked at tooth position, we're going to look at what we call the periodontal scallop, or how are we going to now evaluate the tissue. Right? And so when we think about periodontal scallop, one of the things we want to do is we want to actually be able to get an idea of what is the distance between the existing free gingival margin 
and the osseous crest, both at a facial perspective, but also interproximally. There are several ways to do this. One is to give the patient a little anesthetic um, and sound to bone. Now, sounding to bone can sometimes be highly predictable, and when you have very, very thin facial walls of bone, it can be a little unpredictable because your probe can actually slide past that but we can at least get some ideas of that. We can also look at that through radiography. And so we can now be looking at high quality radiographs and saying, so what's the distance between where the gingiva sits or the existing free gingival margin and the osseous crest, both facially and from an interproximal perspective? And then what does that information tell me? Okay, so the greater that distance is, and so when we have patients who from tip of free gingival margin to the osseous crest is three millimeters versus patient from tip of the uh, gingival margin to the osseous crest is four, five millimeters. The greater that distance, then the higher the risk is for recession. So we want to see those numbers below. We want to see people whose biologic width, their attachment plus their sulcus is going to be in that range of more like average or right in the middle of the bell curve versus the people who have those longer attachments. Because the longer the biologic attachment, the higher the risk for recession. One of the things we talked about very early on was setting patient experience expectations. And I said that, you know, evaluating periodontal scallop or the actual distance from the free gingival margin to the actual osseous crest can be challenging, both with um, sounding to bone and also using radiography. So this is a place that I want my patients to be involved in the treatment planning process. I want them to know what I'm doing. So as we're evaluating the radiographs, as I'm giving them the anesthesia to sound to bone, I want to explain the process to them. And I also want to explain to them that in reality, where we're gonna actually know the answer to this question of what that distance is, is during the first phase of the surgical procedure. So the surgeon, whoever actually takes the tooth out, is gonna be able to clearly visually see this distance. And then we're gonna be able to say, now we know what this parameter was. But that what we're trying to do on the front end is get as much information about it as possible so that we can assess the risk. So I want the patient involved in the process around implant dentistry, that there are unknowns. There are lots of things that we can find out. We can start to gather information to make things more predictable. And yet, there are unknowns about how their body is going to respond, the reaction of the biology, and there are unknowns about the actual situation clinically, the thickness of the bone, places where they may have dihiscences, things like that, that we don't know until we start that surgical procedure. And one of them is periodontal scallop, or the actual distance of their biologic attachment. Now, as we're also evaluating the tissue contours, I want to look next at what um, periodontists and surgeons refer to as the periodontal biotype, or um, you know, what is the tissue profile like? Um, and I will tell you that um, using terminology like high scallop or low scallop um, is very common, and one of the things that I find that's challenging about that is I will sometimes um, misinterpret. I'll say something is a high scallop, and the surgeon um, will actually say, no, I actually think this is kind of a low scallop case, or I think that we have more um, friable tissue, that this is a case that's, that's more in tune with the risk of recession. And so one of the things that I've kind, kind of come to understand as a shortcut for me um, is to simply, when I'm doing my measurements, when I'm actually getting my cellular measurements, to literally evaluate. I use them for this. I'll still use a metal probe when the tooth is still in place. And if I can actually see the shadow, the grayish color of that periodontal probe through the sulcus, then for me, I actually say that this is thin tissue with a higher risk of recession. If the tissue is thick enough, it's fibrous enough, that the color of the probe completely disappears in the sulcus, and so I still have the same natural pinkish tight tissue color when I'm doing my probe measurements, then I say that this is tissue that's more stable. And so for me, that's a shortcut around periodontal biotype, and many of you may already have this part of it kind of nailed. You understand those differences, but you do want to look at that. So we do want to look at the people that, um, that have that nice, thick tissue that's going to be um, less at risk for recession versus the patients who have that very thin, um, very fragile periodontal tissue. And we know then they're going to be in that high risk category from a standpoint of recession. What about tooth shape? So the actual physical contours um, of the tooth. 
And so one of the things that we want to look at is, you know, do we have triangular teeth? Do we have very, very square teeth? Okay. Um, and what we're looking at is what is the shape of the tooth basically coronal to the free gingival margin? Um, because that's really going to influence the volume of tissue that's in our interproximal embrasures, okay? Now, when we look at the shape of the tooth, sort of apical to the free gingival margin, where that's going to influence us is with things like root proximity and recession. And so we talked about the fact that we really want a minimum of a millimeter and a half of osseous crest dimension between the tooth we're going to remove and place a fixture and the teeth on either side adjacently. So again, this idea of root proximity and its influence on recession. So the, the, if we have less than a millimeter and a half of interproximal bone, if we have a situation where we have root proximity because we have very large sort of bulbous roots on teeth or because the teeth are, you know, rotated or crowded, then that's going to put us at a higher risk of recession. When we have teeth where we have nice root proximity, then are we still going to get recession? Absolutely. There's no way to eliminate it, but we're going to be in that category of it being much more predictable. Okay? And then when we look at the situation where we have coronal to the free gingival margin, now we want to really, what we're trying to evaluate is, are we or aren't we going to be able to um, impact the, the absence of black triangles? And so one of the things that we can do with a tooth is we can actually change that. We can lengthen the contact on a tooth. We can look at a single tooth and we can talk to the patient about we're going to need to take this tooth out and we're going to put an implant here. But if you look at your tooth shape, what we might want to do is put a veneer or a crown or a restoration on an adjacent tooth. This is you know, often something you're going to treatment plan with your patients when you're talking about a single central so that now you can actually affect tooth shape on both teeth. So now you have influence over diminishing the volume of the gingival embrasures, making it more likely you'll have papilla fill, less likely you'll have a black triangle, lengthening contacts, so we want to go into this part of our treatment planning. You know, the tooth shape is what the tooth shape is prior to extraction. We have some ability to now alter or choose different shapes post-removal of the tooth, but we want to make sure we have those conversations with our patients and that if we are going to make dramatic changes to tooth shape, that we think about how do we create symmetry for that across the midline or across the arch of the teeth. So tooth shape is going to be something that's important. And so you probably already kind of inferred this from what I was saying, um, but when we have nice square teeth already, um, we have the least risk of developing a black triangle, okay? When we have those very, very tapered teeth, those very triangular teeth, um, so really from the from the osseous crest or the free gingival margin to the contact, the tooth really widens out toward the contact. That's when we're going to have our greatest risk of black triangles. And what will we do with it? We're going to move toward a more square tooth shape as part of the restoration of that and having that conversation with the patient. So, you know, we're starting to put a process together. Um, and I think we all kind of have, have this picture in our head of, you know, what do we love to see when we're going to lose a tooth and do an implant? We love to see an existing tooth. So we know the bone and the tissue has been held in place. We like the free gingival margin on the tooth that's going to be removed to actually be incisal to the adjacent free gingival margin so that when we get our recession, now we actually get symmetry versus being at the same position or more apical or more gingival where we know now we're going to get that long tooth appearance. We like to see those square teeth with the really thick fibrotic gingival tissue. We like to see teeth that are in the arch or in alignment with the adjacent teeth and or lingually. Those are our low risk, those are our high predictability implant cases. And then how does the, the predictability go down or the risk go up? By each one of those factors getting added to it. So every factor adds a little more risk. When you have the implant situation where you have a tooth that's facially positioned, very triangular in shape, has very thin tissue, and already has a free gingival margin that's more apical to the adjacent teeth, and now you're going to take it out and you're going to place an implant there, that's a pretty high-risk situation. What? How do we deal with that? Well, the first thing that I think about is, how do I alter the position? So can I use orthodontics before I have the tooth extracted to correct that? Can we extrude the tooth, bringing the free gingival margin 
equal to or incisal to the adjacent teeth we're going to be maintaining? Can we retrocline that tooth or tip that tooth to the lingual? You know, what are the things we can do? I can't alter existing tooth shape, but I can alter existing tooth position. So thinking about that and saying, if this is my optimal situation for implant placement and this is what I have, how do I take what I have and make it more optimal before I send the patient to the surgeon and have them simply take that root out and now leave me with a situation that's highly unpredictable? What about the, the bone? Where is the osseous? Where is the actual bone? Well, we all know that the position, the thickness, the relative uh, health of the bone is critical when we do implant placement, when we take a tooth out and we put an implant in. And so one of the things that we already have mentioned is the distance from the osseous crest to the free gingival margin. And so the bigger that distance, the broader or bigger the patient's biologic attachment, then the greater their risk of recession is. You know, what do I like to see? Sort of what is in that range of, as I said before, right in the middle of the bell curve? Um, those are people where mid-facial, when I sound to bone, distance from the, the existing gingival position to the osseous crest is about three millimeters, and interproximally, it's no more than four millimeters. So that's what I love to see or less. When I start to see numbers that are greater than that, now I know I'm dealing with a patient where, again, doesn't mean we can't place an implant, but what it means is they have a higher risk of gingival recession than the patient who has a more ideal distance. How do I optimize that? Let's say I have a patient that has a free gingival margin that's absolutely symmetric on a single central with the adjacent central. We're gonna take this one central out and they have a long biologic attachment. Well, I may think about extruding that tooth orthodontically, now moving that free gingival margin, not just one millimeter incisal to the adjacent tooth we're going to keep, but how about a millimeter half or two millimeters, giving ourselves some room. I love it when I have a situation where I have to alter the contour of a final restoration or an abutment to move the gingival margin apically because we have the ability to do that. We don't have the ability at that point when we're in the restorative phase to move it incisally. So how do we optimize these situations? The next thing that I wanna talk about, which moves a little bit beyond sort of the surgical phase, um, into the surgical phase, is how do we manage the tissue optimally? So one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna take advantage of when the tooth is still in place from a treatment planning perspective. So I much prefer to slow the process down, take my time when I still have a tooth in place, okay? Very often that we will actually tell the patient that what we recommend is that they do endodontic therapy on a tooth and we put it in a provisional knowing full well we're gonna extract the tooth and place a fixture because we wanna make sure there's no infection and we wanna hang on to that tooth root all the way through the treatment planning process and potentially into a pre-operative phase where we can optimize the position. You know, one of the things that is so hard about that conversation is when you have a patient that's got a broken down front tooth, you know, they fractured it off, it's hurting, you know, they wanna do something and they wanna do it now. And so I get, I get that feeling of being pressured to solve the situation very, very quickly. And when we just rush into taking out the existing tooth root, we eliminate a lot of our options. So one of the things we want to do is we want to slow the process down, ask ourselves, what do we do to get the patient comfortable? What do we do to solve their immediate aesthetic needs? And what do we do to make sure that there's no infection so that then we can all calmly and confidently treatment plan this case and say, what can we do to optimize our outcomes where we need this tooth, we need the root of this tooth in order to be able to do that? So that's that process. Now, once we're actually ready to go ahead and do the surgery, one of the things that has the greatest impact on the long-term success gingively and from the standpoint of the bone and the osseous is minimizing surgical trauma. Now, I will tell you that I'm not a surgeon. I don't do the surgery, but I work with surgeons that have this at the forefront of their mind, that they are really using the state of the art in our technology right now to remove teeth as atraumatically as possible and to deal with the tissue as atraumatically as possible. So, you know, some of the things we think about is, you know, we don't want to lay a flap if we don't have to lay a flap. So now, sometimes do you have to? Of course you have to. But if you don't have to, let's not do that and let's get that 
that tooth root out of there without traumatizing the papilla, without actually reflecting the tissue. If we do have to do some sort of a surgical intervention around the tissue, we have to remove tissue, we have to create an incision, how can we do it as atraumatically as possible? You know, so one of the things I love about CO2 technology, and whether it's being used on the surgeon's side or on my side, is it creates very little um, tissue trauma beyond the actual cells that are involved when, where I am either removing the tissue or making the incision. So from a surgical trauma perspective, we're gonna get the least trauma to the tissue, we're gonna get the maximum benefit that we can get from the standpoint of what's going on with healing. And so one of the ways to think about how do you incorporate laser, if you're doing your own surgery, I highly recommend you look at incorporating laser, but specifically CO2 technology, which is known for minimizing tissue trauma versus some of the more traditional techniques, especially if you're doing implants and especially if you're doing them in the aesthetic zone. So one of the things I encourage for the restorative dentists who are watching this program is go to lunch with your surgeon, you know, take them out for a change um, and ask them, say, I'd love to know your surgical technique. I'd love to know what are you doing when I refer patients over there for implant placement to maximize the predictability of the post-op gingival position by minimizing surgical trauma and where can we work together maybe to actually continue to optimize those pieces of the puzzle. So just to summarize, I want to just kind of wrap everything around from a standpoint of treatment planning. Really the take home message is we need to know as much as a team, the surgeon and the restorative dentist, we need to come together and we need to put together everything we know about tooth removal and implant placement and its impact on movement or recession of the free gingival margin, resorption of bone, of movement of the osseous crest, and we need to then work together to gather as much data as possible on the treatment planning side, the presenting condition. What can we do to optimize those things before we actually go into a surgical mode and just remove a tooth? And you know, one of the things that I love about using um, technology, this happens to be a scan of a patient, it's the one you saw with the fractured lateral, um, is it really gives us some insight. Not only do we get very, very precise planning, so when I say to the surgeon, I want the fixture lingually positioned in the anterior, that I actually want so that, you know, where the incisal edge is going to come out of the tooth or through the implant placement, I know now that I'm not just depending upon his, um, his hand skills and his visual skills that day, but that we're using a surgical guide and that we're doing everything in our power to place that fixture exactly where we want it to optimize those outcomes. But also pre-treatment, we can look at things like the density of the bone and where osseous crest is and all, some of those things that, that we talked about. And so, you know, I love the fact that um, I don't actually have a CAT scan in my office, but I work with a surgeon who has one, and our patients get the benefit of being able to get this information preoperatively and the precision of the planning. So treatment planning is a key to success. And part of what treatment planning lets us do is it lets us be honest with ourselves and the surgeon to be honest with everybody in the group so that the patient has very, very clear expectations. They know what we can do predictably, where things are unpredictable, and we can do the best job we can, but it's going to depend on how their biology responds, and that we'll manage it either way, what are the outcomes. They can understand the benefit. They can make a choice of doing preoperative ortho to improve tooth position or preoperative grafting to improve some tissue issues or not and taking the risk because they're not as concerned from an aesthetic perspective. So I can't stress enough how, how important it is to gather all the data, to sit down with all of the people involved, from include the ceramist, the surgeon, yourself, the patient, and everybody get on the same page before we rush in and just take teeth out and place fixtures. So with that said, I want to now move into the phase of how do we influence tissue position as a restorative dentist. So what we want to move now is into the phase of the restorative dentist. So the tooth has been removed, the fixture has been placed, and the surgeon has said it's time to restore this implant. So what are the things we can do to optimize tissue position? And maybe more better said is to minimize 
um, sort of the trauma on the tissue and more tissue recession than, than what was um, incurred simply as part of the surgical procedure. And so one of those things is thinking about tissue removal. So, you know, I get implants back from surgeons in a variety of ways um, when I'm doing anterior teeth. So as you saw earlier, sometimes the patient presents to me and all they have in is a healing cap. So what have they been doing from a temporary perspective? They've been wearing some form of an Essex style retainer or a holly with a tooth or something removable. And what's underneath it is simply a traditional healing cap from the implant manufacturer. Sometimes I get uh, fixtures back from the surgeon where what the surgeon has done is they've actually taken a temporary abutment from the implant company and they've actually turned it into um, a tissue development healing cap. So they literally have cut it off at the free gingival margin, but they've actually used material, silicone or acrylic material, to start the process of doing tissue shaping. And other times, um, I get teeth back from the surgeon where we've done immediate implant placement, immediate provisionalization. So we've already, during the healing phase for the osseous crest, we've also had tissue conditioning and healing for the gingiva. So the patient's been wearing a, you know, wearing a provisional. And so, you know, there are pros and cons to all of those pieces. You know, patients obviously love when we can put a screw retained uh, provisional on an implant as soon as possible. Um, patients get tired pretty readily of removable provisionalization. However, when patients understand that, it's in their long-term best interest that it maximizes the predictability of what we're going to get around healing, both at the level of the bone and the level of the tissue. If we don't load or put pressure on that implant, most of them manage through the process. Does that mean they never complain? Does that mean that they don't come in and say, when can I get rid of this thing? Uh, no, it doesn't. But it also means they understand why they're doing it. So I would encourage talk with your surgeons, really understand what are the situations where we can do immediate load, immediate provisionalization without jeopardizing the predictability, and what are the situations where we're better off doing something removable so that then you can have those conversations with your patients. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of research. We hear lots of conflicting information about the pros and cons of those. Um, you know, we went from an era where we never did immediate load, immediate provisionalization to it became very, very popular. Um, I feel like we've sort of swung back the other way now. And so more surgeons are doing it some of the time, but not all of the time. And now we are actually seeing some new research come out about the influence that um, provisional material has, methyl methacrylate bisacryl, on the tissue healing that may lean us in the direction of not doing immediate provisionalization if what we're concerned about is fractions of millimeters in tissue position. So when you get the patient as a restorative dentist, when I get the patient as a restorative dentist, one of the first things that I look at is what do I have right now from a standpoint of position in approximately position free gingival margin. So I go back through my treatment planning process and I evaluate the situation and I ask myself, what do I need to do now? so that we can optimize the tissue positioning. So often, I actually do have to remove tissue. So if I get a patient back that just has a healing cap or has a healing uh, temporary abutment that's been cut off but turned into a more um, ideally contoured healing cap, I still sometimes feel like there's excess tissue that I need to be doing some tissue sculpting or tissue contouring. And so I put that in the category of gingivoplasty. This is a place where my CO2 laser, my Vero laser, comes in incredibly handy. Why? Because I can do very, very fine amounts of gingivoplasty about tissue removal. It's comfortable for the patient. And I cause minimal tissue trauma. So I'm not worried about what in laser technology we call thermal spread because I've got minimal thermal spread. So I'm going to remove the tissue I want to remove, but the tissue that's left behind is going to be able to heal optimally. Um, and we want to be as friendly to the tissue as possible around implants. When we're, when we're moving parts in and out, when we're removing tissue, um, the less trauma we cause, the better the final results are concerned. And so in a situation like the one where you see the pictures, the patient presented with a healing cap, I want to now move to a provisional phase. I've basically gotten very little to no tissue development during the healing phase. And I want to move to provisionalization to create ideal tissue contours so that we get a predictable result. 
One of the things to think about with this, because there is that thought of skipping the provisionalization phase and moving directly to the final phase of final abutment, final crown. Here's the challenge of that. The challenge of that is, is it possible that we can use the measurements from the head of the fixture to the gingival crest, we can design an abutment, we can design a crown, and we can use everything we know about those distances and the healing and the shape of the abutment to successfully predict where the tissue will end up. It's possible. Is it also possible that we could guess wrong or that the patient's body will not respond in that way it is. And here's what's worse. In a situation where you would go just from a healing cap to the final restoration, often what's going to happen is the patient is going to now have to manage an extended period of healing, wondering whether the tissue will fill in. And we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to show you a case just like that. So in a situation where anterior aesthetics is critical, for me, that provisionalization phase is critical because what it tells myself and the patient and the ceramist is what can we accomplish and what can't we accomplish. We get to test our theory. We can test and play with changing the facial contour of the abutment. We can, ch we can change the contour of the tooth. We can decrease the gingival embrasure volume by making the tooth more square until we get those ideal tissues. And then all we have to do is we have to copy that over to the final restoration. And now we create predictability versus doing something that I'm going to say is a guess, but let's say it's clinical intuition, that it's clinical experience, and then having to say to the patient when we put their new tooth in, well, we're going to need to wait 18 months, but trust me, it's all going to work out. So I'm still a big fan of that provisionalization phase because I get to, in real time, test all of my restorative theories watch how the patient's biology responds so that then we know this is the right answer and all the ceramist has to do is copy that for me. So in one of those situations, I may have to go back with my laser and actually create some space to create the subgingival provisional profile. So I'm going to do a very simple laser gingival plasty, just create some space. Now the work that's going to get done is going to get done by my temporary abutment. And so when we do temporization for anterior implants, the shape of the temporary abutment, of the provisional between the free gingival margin and the head of the fixture is going to be absolutely critical in creating that final tissue profile. We actually have a lot of ability to influence final free gingival margin position and papilla position within the extent of moving the biology by the shape of what we do and how we manage that. So one of the things that I do is I spend a ton of time creating that provisional abutment. Now you can actually create a one-piece screw retained provisional or you can do it in two pieces. That's a preference. Either way, the shape of the provisional between the free gingival margin and the head of the fixture is a very critical phase. I create that by using flowable composite. I will actually just flow that on there. I'm going to do a lot of that actually in my hand and I'm just going to sculpt the shape. Then I'm going to polish that. I'm going to use, I use a provisionalization kit that actually has a lot of wheels in them. So they're actually silicone polishing wheels. They not only cut the provisional material or the composite material, but they also create a very, very fine texture. Because one of the other things we want to be very, very sensitive to um, is the polish, the smoothness of any material that we put against those free gingival margins. We want the minimum um, plaque retention. We want the minimum bacteria, the minimum irritation. So instead of shaping this using um, coarse e-cutters or burrs, um, going to those silicone polishers as a, as a shaping step prior to the final polishing step to me is very critical. So I'm going to do the best job I can visually at creating that shape. I'm actually going to create the scallop that we see between interproximal and facial gingival margin. You know, if I'm worried about the gingival margin moving apically, I'm going to create a flatter or I'm going to create a more concave profile on the facial. If I'm worried about the free gingival margin being too incisal, I may create a more convex profile. You know, if I'm worried about papilla form, I may make the, the abutment form broader to try to get as much incisal movement of the papilla tip as possible. 
So I'm going to do all of that shaping. You know, one of the things that I think about when I think about papilla is they're basically like water-filled bags of tissue. And so they are very moldable. You know, we can actually move them in different directions, but within a minor amount of movement. So, you know, we're not going to add millimeters. We're not going to close black triangles magically by changing the shape of the tooth. But we can tweak that position very subtly with that shape. So I'm going to create that. How am I going to know it's going to work? I'm going to keep going back to the fixture. I'm going to be putting it in, and I'm going to be looking. How does it impact tissue position immediately? And you will, you will be amazed at how you see the gingival margin, the free gingival margin move, and the papilla ch shape change immediately when going from either a healing cap to a well-shaped temporary abutment or from a sort of shaped temporary healing cap to a temporary abutment. So tweak things, play with it. And then how are you going to know what ultimately happens? You're going to have to wait for healing. So this is the part where now the patient will be much more um, more patient because they now have a provisional that isn't on a flipper or an Essex retainer, but they need to know we need to let the tissue mature. So we're going to actually allow this provisional to be in place. In my world, usually a minimum of about 12 weeks. Do I wait all the way out to the 12 weeks to take a look at it? I don't. I usually will see the patient back about two weeks after the, uh, the initial placement and evaluate. If my tissue isn't doing what I want it to do, I may go in at that point and start changing the shape of the temporary abutment. But the shape of the abutment between the fixture and the free gingival margin has a great deal of influence over tissue position. So we need to perfect that as on our end as the restorative dentist and we want to play with that. So just like I'm going to do patient approved provisionals for my aesthetic dentistry, I'm going to make some guesses about incisal embrasure form, incisal position, the shape of the teeth, the, the relative shape of the flat reflective surface of a tooth. I'm not going to send it to the ceramist until the patient's worn that in their mouth. We've made the tweaks they want and they look at me and they say, this is exactly the shape of the teeth. I do the same thing with a provisional abutment. I don't typically get as much feedback from the patient as when I'm doing a set of anterior veneer provisionals, but I know I can look at papilla position relative to the other teeth. Have we achieved papilla symmetry? Have we achieved symmetry to the free gingival margins? And once I've optimized that, now I simply have to copy that, and we're going to show a technique for that so the ceramist can mimic my temporary abutment shape exactly. So really important step to work on. The other thing you do want to do is you want to make sure once you get your shape that this is polished exquisitely. So I use the Pro V Pro polishing system from Brassler. I'm going to polish everything after my silicone wheels and then clean the temporary abutment prior to putting it back in the mouth against the tissue. So you want to use a really very technique sensitive, very technique specific way that you're going to make sure you don't put polishing paste or debris or residue down against those healing free gingival margins. And so you really want to think about how you're handling that. Um, and you definitely don't want to be handling them with, you know, with your hands and then putting stuff back in unless you go through that process. Another place to think about provisionalization or tissue health is abutment removal. Now, there is going to be a certain amount of the time that we have to go back and forth. We have to take parts and pieces off of the fixture, work in our hands, put them back in. But one of the things to know is every time you move those parts in and out, you are traumatizing the tissue. You're increasing the risk that you're going to see some recession. So don't be cavalier about taking parts off and on. You want to be judicious. You want to think about how do I minimize, how do I only move parts off and on this fixture the absolute number of times that I have to. And as I said, we want to think about making sure that anytime we take something off and put it back on, that we've cleaned it appropriately, that we've, you know, and you can't really get it all the way to sterilize, but that you've eliminated bacteria, you've eliminated um, restorative material debris and residue, because all of those things are going to influence how the tissue responds. You know, one of the things that's absolutely critical when we seat a permanent restoration on an implant is making sure that we get rid of all of the cement that's in the sulcus. You know, one of the techniques that I've learned to do that is to very gently using a plastic instrument, a plastic 
plastic instrument, place a cord just below the margin, the crown margin on the abutment in the sulcus around an implant. Why? Because then I'm not going to have extrusion of cement down deep into that sulcus because that's the challenge with implant sulcuses is they're very deep and stuff just you put pressure on the crown with cement and where does it go? It goes out the margins down that tissue. So what does the little piece of cord do? I mean, does the cord in and of itself create a little tissue trauma? It does. You have to be very gentle. You don't want to put it down deep. You want it to sit literally right at the prep margin. But what it does is it makes all the temporary cement or the permanent cement, whatever you're using, get forced up over the margins of the crown, not down. Then you can pull the cord up over the crown once it's set, again, pulling everything up, pulling it incisally, so that you're going to minimize, if not eliminate, the amount of cement that goes down into that sulcus. Because leaving cement behind down there is really, really traumatic to the tissue. So whether it's the permanent crown and abutment, or it's temporaries or healing caps or anything else that we're going to do, we want to make sure that we minimize movement of parts and pieces and that we always make sure that everything is clean and disinfected as much as possible when we move parts and pieces in and around all of those implants. And so you can see here, this is that same single central that came in with just the healing abutment. I did the laser gingivectomy around a temporary abutment. I created that temporary abutment using flowable composite in my hand, sculpted it, and now this is about 12 weeks out and we're actually getting really nice tissue development. We're actually getting cellular form that would look very similar to had there been a tooth root and a crown of a tooth there. That's what we want to try to create in this provisional phase. While we're on the subject of taking parts and pieces off, once we have begun the process of developing tissue contour, one of the things that can be absolutely challenging is how do we maintain that tissue contour. As I said, all that tissue is just um, water filled. And so as soon as you take away the shape of the abutment and the provisional that was holding that position, it takes literally less than a second before everything starts to slump in and now you're losing your shape. That creates two problems. One, in the impression phase, we're going to talk about how do you actually capture that tissue contour adequately. Um, but the other one is every time you then have to move parts on and off, um, then you get new blanching, you get tissue pinching that's uncomfortable for the patient. Well, one of probably the greatest tricks I've ever learned, um, I learned it from Frank Spear, is the use of Mach 2. It's a dye silicone. It's a product made by Parkell. I know, I, I know we have it here in the United States. I can't speak for outside the United States, but it's Parkell, P-A-R-K-E-L-L. -L. The product is Mach 2. You can see here how to spell that on the slide. And it's a dye silicone. I don't know whether there's a lot of labs that actually use it to fabricate dyes, but I use it for lots and lots of techniques as a restorative dentist. One of those is we keep a gun with a fresh tip of Mach 2 on the tray table at all times whenever we're doing implant dentistry. Because when I take a part off the fixture, I can immediately squirt Mach 2 and it holds the tissue form. It actually prevents debris from getting into the fixture, into the screw hole. And because it's silicone, it sets in about 30 to 40 seconds maximum. When I want to remove it, I literally just stab it with the tine of an explorer and it pops out sort of like a cork. And I can actually save it and put it back in so I don't have to re-inject if I'm going to move parts in and out. So I've now captured my tissue form perfectly and it works to seal everything, hold the tissue form, and allow me the time to work without tissue distortion. So if you're not already using Mach 2, um, as I said, I use it for lots of different techniques as a restorative dentistry. It's one of my products that I depend on. This is one of the applications, is how do we cover the, the screw hole and hold the tissue form when we're doing the things we need to do to work on anterior provisionals, anterior implants. So if you haven't tried it, I suggest you get a little Mach 2. So then the next step is, you know, we've, we've done the treatment planning. We've had the tooth removed, the fixture's been placed, we're through the healing phase, and as the restorative dentist now, I am thrilled with the tissue contours we've created with our temporary abutment. But now I actually have to send that information to the laboratory. I have to give the ceramist some way to replicate that so that they're not actually guessing and recreating it on their own. 
So that temporary abutment shape is critical. Giving them the shape of the abutment is actually as important, if not more important, than the actual shape of the tissue. Why? Because capturing an accurate tissue impression is very, very challenging. Even with the use of Mach 2, even if I say I'm going to try my tray in, I'm going to set everything up so that literally all I have to do is remove the provisional and put the impression, the, the impression coping in and inject, there's no way that in that even small amount of time, no matter how efficient you are or how streamlined you make the process, that you aren't going to get alteration in tissue shape, that you aren't going to get slumping, which means that in that VPS impression, you can see here, this is again our single central that we've been looking at throughout the program. The top uh, photograph is Flexitime from Horaeus, and it's the actual closed tray impression. And I did that as efficiently as I know how, and yet I know that's not an accurate representation of what the shape of my abutment looked like or the tissue shape looked like from the free gingival margin down to where the head of the fixture was because of that little bit of tissue change and slumping in that time interim. So what is it that I do to help the technician have that information? Well, I actually send them an impression of my temporary abutment. So what I do is, while I've got the temporary abutment out for impression taking, I've ordered an analog, so I have in my office an analog for that fixture. I seat my temporary abutment on the analog, and now I actually impress the underside of the temporary abutment so that they now have two things. They actually have the VPS impression to show them the nice scalloping and they have a tissue or level impression of my temporary abutment. So there's two ways to do this. You can actually see here where it's been done with basically stat stone or rapidly setting stone. So what I did is I use a little tiny medicine cup because you don't want to waste a lot of material. So I just get some of those little um, pill cups or medicine cups and you can buy those at a drugstore or from a medical supply company. And in this case, I actually took my temporary abutment, I connected it to an analog, I put a little bit of lubricant around the underside of all of the, the provisional material, and then I put stat stone just maybe about like an inch thick to the, you know, in that little medicine cup, and then I just set or submerged the provisional, the uh, analog, and the temporary abutment into the stone and let it sit there until it sets. Once it's fully set, I literally just unscrew and take my temporary abutment out and then here's what you have. You have the stat stone with the analog and the impression of the tissue shape, the tissue contouring of my temporary abutment. Now, after doing this particular case, which is actually um, several years old now, um, I had a conversation with my ceramist, and he said, you know, this is great, except it's really hard for me to actually use that to contour. They can use it to wax and do things like that for the abutments. He said, it'd be better if we could figure out a way to do that in silicone. So we've actually since then started doing it. So whether you want to use your tray material from your VPS or you want to use um, bite registration paste works pretty well also. Now what I do is I just fill that medicine cup with basically monophase or tray material of my VPS and then I just submerge that actual abutment and analog into that material, let it set, and then do the same thing. And so now what the ceramists can do is they can go back and forth between the actual closed tray, the model they got from the closed tray impression, and this impression that I've given them of the underside. Are they going to precisely replicate it? No. But now they have as much information as at least I've figured out how to give them um, so that they can mimic the shape of that abutment because that's what's going to create predictability between the tissue positioning, the free gingival margin placement and papilla position in your temporary to the ceramics is about mimicking the shape of the abutment from the free gingival margin to the fixture as accurately as we possibly can. And so that's a technique to try. Talk with your ceramist about it. You may even be able to improve on it and come up with some other ideas. When we talk about abutment design, one of the things that I did want to talk about, and I, I mentioned this briefly before, is that the design of the abutment is going to be integral in where our free gingival margin shows up. Now this happens to be a very interesting case. It's a patient who came in, implant and crown already in place. She had had a ton of gingival recession, young woman, beautiful, high smile line of course, 
and really wanted us to do something to improve the situation. Well, we've already got a fixture in place, so I can't go all the way back. I could, I could ask myself what could have been done treatment planning that would have improved this situation, but it, it already is where it is, and now we have some choices. You know, she was not open to the idea of simply burying the implant and doing something different. Um, trefining it out was, didn't seem like a great option, so now we're left with how do we try to improve it? Well, we only have really two ways to try to improve it. One is through grafting, so on the surgical side, we can try to do the best we can do with grafting. And the other is on the restorative side. And the only place that I can influence it is with changing the facial profile of the abutment. So very simply, when we make the facial profile of an implant abutment convex, we move the free gingival margin apically. When we make the facial profile of an implant abutment flat or neutral or concave, we allow the tissue to come in sizally, to sit in sizally. We can't really move it in sizally, but we can at least allow it to drape on the tooth without pressure from the abutment moving it apically. Okay. So in that situation, what would I love? I'd love a free gingival margin that's incisal to where I want it so that now I just keep increasing the convexity of the abutment and I sort of nudge that tissue in a gingival or apical position versus where it's not in the right position, it's already apical or right at the right level, in which case I want to make sure that my abutment is flat or it's convex to allow the tissue to fall as much as possible. So we really want to be critical about it. In this case, this is actually pre-surgical, so one of the things that I did was um, we decided to go with a um, very flat facial profile zirconia abutment. Literally, it's coming right out of the fixture um, pre-surgically so that A, the surgical site was healing, the tissue was healing against a polished zirconia surface, and we got rid of that worry about um, provisional material, bisacryl, how well is it, is it uh, polished, is there bacteria down? there um, and we wanted to get that very flat profile started quickly to allow that tissue to heal. So really think about what does the facial profile look like. As the restorative dentist you need to be dictating that to the ceramist not simply um, allowing them to do whatever they think um, is most appropriate which is normally either what they were taught or you know what's easiest to create where the margin placement will be. So abutment design is going to be a critical factor in here. And now just to sort of follow this through, you can see um, this is that abutment and my bisacral provisional. So what you're going to notice is my provisional margin is now where I want it ideally, just tucked subgingival or equigingival after the surgery. So I've actually provisionalized this tooth as a way to communicate to the surgeon so he can now use the provisional margin on this case to know where to graft and then you can see the actual sort of um, immediate post-op situation where we've got all of that grafting in place. You know, is this something that's highly predictable? It's not. This is something the patient knows ahead of time. We're going to do the best we can do. We're going to apply the best science and the best technology we have at our, at our fingertips right now. But your body is going to do what your body is going to do, and we'll have to see that. Is it possible that we may have to go back and graft multiple times? Absolutely. And only the patient will get to say when it's good enough and when she's ready to have it be done and put the permanent abutment and crown on, or she's willing to do more from a surgical side to intervene with that. But we wanted to optimize our outcome by changing the facial profile of this abutment to give that tissue the best chance possible. And then what do you do in other situations where now you do have to change some things? So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to, okay, we got what we got. We did the best that we can do from a standpoint of planning and surgery and tissue management, um, and it's still not an optimal design. So a couple of things to think about. So this is that lateral incisor um, that we talked about early on where the patient came in with it fractured. And, and this particular patient um, decided that he wanted to get on with his permanent crown immediately. He had been in Essex retainers with a tooth all through Invisalign, all through the fixture placement, all through healing. 
We talked about the pros and cons, the risks and benefits of provisionalization and tissue development versus just using the mathematics that we know about distances from the head of the fixture to free gingival margin and then creating tooth form and then allowing his tissue to heal. And he made the choice for himself that he wanted me to go from just a healing cap under an Essex retainer to the final abutment and to the final crown. And so I did the best that I know using the science and technology with measurements and telling the ceramist how to design the facial profile. Now, he has a couple things going for him. One is he has a very low lip line, which is why it's not super urgent to him. Um, and you really can't see any of this other than in this photo I have retractors in. The other reason is, you know, he's got great tissue position. So his existing tissue position is incisal. It's actually incisal even to the lateral on the other side. He's got that nice thick tissue. He really did well with all of his healing. And what I know from looking at this is, and this, was, this photograph was taken immediately with seating of the abutment and putting the crown on, is will that black triangle fill in? there's actually a very good chance. Now it may take up to 18 months and he knows that, but slowly we'll watch. Is there also a chance it won't completely fill in? There is. So to do something like this, the patient has to be okay with it either way. I'm okay if it stays just like this. I think this is a great result and outcome. And I'm okay if it actually gets better. If the patient is not gonna be okay with this as a final outcome, and or any little improvement that happens, then this would be a patient to say, we've got to do the provisional, we've got to do tissue development, we've got to be able to send that information to the laboratory to maximize that. And in that situation, what do you do? So again, it's about treatment planning. You know, Could you go back now and improve on this scenario? Well, I can think of a couple ways you could improve on it. We could do something restoratively to the distal of the central incisor. I don't know that we can change the shape of the lateral any more than I did. I think we've contoured it. We've squared it up as much as possible. But what we could do is treatment plan the distal of that central incisor, lengthen the contact. We could also do something using pink porcelain or pink composite. So if we actually want to do some papilla fill there, we'd have some options. Um, there are some really great new techniques people are doing where they're actually injecting dermal fillers into papilla to sort of just puff up the papilla. Um, you know, that's, that's cutting edge. But one of the things to also know, we've talked mostly in this program about planning and tissue management. But the other tool to have in your toolbox when you're trying to do anterior implants and have exquisite results is what are the restorative techniques I have in my toolbox to visually correct a situation that isn't optimal from a position of tooth position, papilla position, free gingival margin position. So getting gifted at the ideas of how do you use pink porcelain or pink composite Thinking about your treatment planning beyond a single tooth. How do you treatment plan multiple teeth here to optimize the outcome? Those are all conversations we need to have on the front end with our patient, not at this point, because at this point, if you put this in and the patient said, oh my God, you're kidding, I, don't, I can't have that like that with that black triangle there, it's too late to have a conversation about, well, we could veneer your central or we could put composite on your central or we could add some pink porcelain or some pink uh, composite to that crown because now it occurs as if we're fixing a problem. If it had been planned on the front end and we anticipated that, then it's something that the patient can either say, you know, in the beginning you did say we might have to talk about that, or they've already done it. You've already been treatment plan, you know, you've already been executing that plan so that you can get those optimal results. So do think about those things because with the best planning, and the best tissue management, we're still not gonna get 100% of the time when we talk about anterior implants, the tissue results that we all hope for. We wanna optimize them as much as possible and then plan for those times when that doesn't occur. With that, I wanna thank you for being with us today. I hope this has been valuable information. Again, I wanna thank uh, Dental XP for hosting this, and I wanna thank DECA um, for sponsoring this. For more information on any of these topics, please visit my website. I got lots of blogs there. Also, I'd say go back to Dental XP. They probably have the greatest library of online CE around implant dentistry of anybody out there right now. So there's lots of opportunities for that. 
and hopefully um, I will be able to spend some more time with you in the future on other Dental XP programs.